Thanks, everyone, for attending uh, Flatten the Curve uh, Summit. And uh, uh, let me, I, I guess I'll, I'll start with a quick introduction. Um, this talk is, uh, is about free and open software, open source software, distributed communities by me and Ether. Uh, so it's a little bit about myself. My name is Sri Ramakrishna. Krishna. Uh, you can call me Sri. It's, I realize sometimes it's a little hard to say that name. Um, I, my background is I've been part of the free and open source software for about 23 years or so. I, I started off in, uh, uh, in, uh, in free software and, uh, my passion has always been about with, with tech communities and, uh, working with them and engaging with them and everything else. And it's been a huge passion of mine. And lately now, um, uh, I, I'm really interested in in joining communities together and being a liaison and and having them work with each other. And I've had a, a couple of incubation projects that that I'm really excited about. So um, anyway, that's a little bit of who I am and what um, what I do. And um, I guess I'll get started. Uh, a lot of what this talk when I came up with was really trying to um, apply. The, the, the kind of, you know, let me get to the next first slide here. <laughs> might, that might work a little better. Um, it, a lot of what I, when I came up with, with this talk is, it, is you know, we're living in a, a, a we're, we're kind of, we're, we're having a paradigm forced upon us, right? And uh, in this new world of, of COVID-19, and my strong feeling is that we're not going to come out of this unchanged. This this is something that is going to change us. It's going to change our culture. It's going to change how we interact with each other. It's going to change how we do business with each other. There's there's a lot of things that it's going to happen after these tumultuous times are are over. And um, so um, and I really wanted to know, like how can my experience, the experience of of open source tech, uh, open open source tech communities, how does this apply uh, in, in this world, in this new world that we find ourselves in? And so I, I think the first start off right um, when when we build software. And, in free and open source, uh, we've always been a community that's been disconnected. Uh, and I don't mean disconnected in an emotional sense or any of that kind of kind of thing, but we are basically communities that work with developers or, or, or rather um, uh, people who work in our community in disparate locations. And we've been doing this for 25 years, and which really is aligned around the time that the internet became popular and became pervasive in, uh, in the world, right? And that, was, that really is what got free and open source software on, onto this rapid ramp that we had. And, um, we built collab this collaboration model that has birthed the modern IT infrastructure. So for 25 years, that's that's what we did. And in that time frame, um, we we've been building um, all these tools, uh, interaction models, and various other things, and. With all of that, you know, we've leveraged all these things. And I know like uh, every business sector, as I said, you know, we're kind of forced into this paradigm. And, and while we're able to sort of move forward in, this, in, in the COVID world, I know that every business sector is going to have its own unique set of challenges uh, that's going to be specific for them. Um, we just happen 
to be able to leverage us better because we really grew up in the internet age and we're all working together from these disparate, uh, disparate uh, ways, right? So, so the, the idea, again, going to this talk is how, how could we leverage that experience and if there's a process to, uh, or maybe at least have a discussion and how can, how can this work in other sectors? Uh, unless I, I go over time, and then maybe that <laughs> on, uh, through uh, uh, maybe our chat or any other kind of hallway conversation. So, so I, the, we, you know, it's always great to start from the beginning, and um, I don't mean the very beginning. Uh, uh, for me, the beginning is um, in the mid '90s, and just as the uh, uh, certain pieces has come together and we're able to create a project that we care about. Uh, so it usually starts, you know, as a, as a, how our tech community starts. So uh, what I want to do is sort of go through um, how a tech community starts and evolves with its tools and services and, and overall, and see what happens with just one and then multiply that by many times, right? So the first one, you know, you've, you've got uh, a person's or many persons, they have an idea and uh, they're, they, they want to work on this project. And, and you know, the, I, 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 I come from, I'll just use a little bit of personal experience. I come from a project called GNOME, which we built a desktop on top of the Linux platform. And um, this, this is sort of a, a little bit of how that started. And it's a good project to start with because it did start in the mid nineties, unlike a lot of other projects. So it's kind of great to see how that evolves over time as a model. But when we get to the end, uh, how a project starts is nowhere near this level of, of, of complexity. So uh, anyway, it, a various people comes with this aspiration idea. It could be a very large idea and complex idea like a desktop, but it could be other minor, minor things as well. So there's this idea that you have these communica communication tools like uh, a chat server, uh, some place to store your source code, uh, some some service that uh, lets you formally lodge uh, issues with the source code or anything else, and then a mailing list, which sort of is your formal formal way of communicating um, that you know you have some sort of record for. Uh, there's usually somebody who does DevOps. Uh, IT would sort of manage UC servers, and you know it, it's it's kind of you know, a, a a a kind of put together with bailing wire and and uh, uh, tape and so forth. So uh, it starts there, and it, you know it sort of works. We're, we're getting there, and thanks to the internet, we can we can kind of get our work done. And um, but. You know, as time goes on, we uh, we get a little, we got a little bit more. Um, we make some progress, right? And you know, I, I feel like when I'm going through these slides, it's a lot like the game Civilization. If anybody played that game, it feels like you start off with that little village, and then you're slowly working your way. <laughs> way, way over it, and in many ways, it does feel uh, similar. The progression is a little similar to that game, and uh, so going to the slide now, you've got a little bit more sophistication. So now you've got your mailing list, you get your usual stuff. Now you have a website uh, to to kind of showcase your project. Uh, there's a, an associated webmaster who's got to take care of it, and now we care a little bit. And because you have a website, you have other other kind of things there, like for better communications. You have blogs. Somebody has come up with some way to extract uh, code summaries uh, from the source code server, and and lo and behold, we have consumers. We have people who are 
interested in this project and uh, is uh, wanting to use it and, and play with it and whatnot and, and move forward. Next, now we jump to the next stage, which now we got a little bit more sophistication. Now, and now as a, and one of the one of the reasons why I'm going through this is we're we start it's the multiplexing of more teams and more complexity in their communication, right? So I mean, when we go there, we just have set of developers, like it's just a, a uni, unitary set of people doing kind of one thing, and and now we're adding more teams with who have a different set of requirements. So now we have a bug squad that knows how to triage the, the bug issues. You have, now we've added designers because uh, when we want to make these applications look good on, our, on, the, on this platform, we, we want to create a, a human interface guideline. We have all these things. And now your website is, is also, you know, becoming a little bit more sophisticated because in this time frame while this is going on, these tools are getting more sophisticated. And so uh, division of labor gets sophisticated as well. And so you, your website now needs a front end web de designer and a back end designer and so forth. Uh, you're, you're, you got a little bit more fancy on your code repository because all those services are there. And now you have IT services because now you, maybe you want a, a storage server, you may want uh, uh, not just a chat server, but uh, a, a wiki or some of these other things you want to take care of. And your consumers, there were consumers before, and now they've turned into a community. And that means there's a, a, a bilateral conversation just happening between communities and the, uh, the project. Right. So now the layers of communication is happening. And again, all of this connected in, in various parts of the world are now working in conjunction here. And that's where now suddenly you need a, a community manager here that uh, is that's going to have to uh, mitigate the noise to signal ratio that happens between them. Because as you're scaling these communications, now you've got to find ways to, to make them make conversation matter more. Next is we, we sort of remove our slide, I'm sorry, we remove the, the chat server, which, you know, we, we use text uh, back in the day. Uh, IRC is probably still, it will always will be there uh, uh, as, as a foundational chat service. And, uh, but, you know, now people need a little bit more because now there's, like I said, we have designers and bug squad. They, they want to be able to show pictures uh, of the, the kind of things they're doing. They want to do, uh, so something like Slack comes in or Matrix, which we're using today. Uh, actually, I should have used Matrix instead of Slack since we all seem to be familiar with that. But anyway, uh, um, we have uh, some sophistication in how we, Promote conversations. Are those those are much more sophisticated than was before. Oops. Next slide. I think. Oh, that's right. I keep want to double click on the on the thing to go to the next one. <laughs> so, and now now your project is really getting good, right? Now your your community is growing larger. Your uh, your the, the complexity of the project is getting uh, more and more. By this time, right, I was saying, I'm, I'm using GNOME as my example here because it's come from the 90s. Now you're like 20 year, 22, 20 year code base. Uh, and, and now we need, and now we, we need even more sophistication, right? So now your, your infrastructure is now moving to cloud services because there are other tech communities going on in other places, developing other technologies that we're consuming. So this migration now is going to cloud services, right? And now we can virtualize our services without having to, to have servers in somebody's closet or something. And we have 
much more sophistication there. And now we're adding more teams. Now we, we have some sort of quality assurance. We have translators, we have quality assurance. We have translators that, uh, you know, we want to have uh, in different languages. And, and now we, we find a need to have project managers because these project managers are, 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 are ways to manage everything that's happening. Uh, you also, and including the community management uh, and various other things, and, and also how your release, how your releases are getting done. So you, you're starting seeing some more sophistication. Now we pulled out those old, uh, the older code repositories, and we're replacing it with something like GitLab or GitHub, uh, which, which uh, you know, depending on which one works for you. Uh, that gets that gets added, and now you're adding forums because guess what? Uh, mailing lists don't scale, <laughs> and so uh, and so now we're, we're fine. And, and there's also a lower barrier of entry. Nobody wants to give out their email addresses now because privacy concerns have grown since the time we started. And now it's better to to have more passive ways of communicating without. Uh, uh, giving giving away your valuable data, privacy data. So all of that comes put together, and then that forms just one tech community that's building a specific technology, and in this case, using building a desktop, and. Um, if you want to think about that a little bit, that's just one of many, right? One of many uh, communities building things disconnectedly uh, in a, a non-central fashion. So there's your one, but that's just one one community. But then it grows, right? Um, as as things like GitHub or other repositories comes in. Uh, the bar of entry of starting such a thing becomes even easier because we, we found ways to make uh, technology work for us in this disconnected state. Now you have one, now it's three, and then it goes up to four, and all of them each creating their own set of, of of technology that we're all starting to dive food in among each other. And it turns out that they're really just turning into building blocks. Building tech communities turning into building blocks, creating technology all out in the open. And if you think about it, the scale that's happening in this sector, because one one could represent if it's something like you know like four or five hundred people, and then a community of of, uh, of maybe ten thousand, fifteen thousand, twenty thousand on up um, that surrounds them, uh, the the people who consume them, and then each of these others are similar, especially for the more popular ones. But then you also get into really small ones that maybe one or two developers or things like that. But in the end, you know, they're all creating technology that that we're all starting to, to work with each other from. And this is, this is why I'm really excited about these kinds of things. This, this idea of building blocks is such a wonderful and interesting thing that's happening in real time. And year after year, and you can see it going. And it's, it's, just, it's just such a, it, it, observing But you know, there's also all these other concerns that's happening with privacy and security and everything else as we grow with these technologies, because you know that's how the world is. We have good people, and then we have people who who don't have intentions of being good. So you know. So uh, anyway, but the point is, is over these past 25 years, we created you know, the modern I, uh, infrastructure, all open infrastructure. And um, I, this graph sort of represents, it's, it's not a whole representation of 
with all that's been produced, right? This is just a, a fraction of what's out there. But I, want, I wanted to at least put these things into some kind of uh, label of how they come up together, right? Uh, starting from the beginning. And so if you look at like at, at hardware, you know, we're, we're building things like open firmware. And if you don't know what, uh, for those who don't know, firmware is just that interface to hardware that software can interact with. Right and, and uh, open hardware. In fact, there's a, there's projects like Open Compute Project that I work with specifically that are building um, uh, even the design of how a, uh, the physical server enclosure is being built uh, and uh, various other bits. So you know, even the, and these are all major companies working with each other, understanding that they don't have to start from scratch anymore. They can start from uh, a, a more important part where they can save their engineering time on that. So, I mean, this is one of the great things about openness. But, and, and so there's that, and then there's bootstrap tools. And this is where GNU, the, 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 the project that really free software hangs around, uh, is, is really ushered in this age is through uh, the GNU tools like GCC, which is the, the C compiler. It, back in the 90s, to to get a happy C compiler, one of the most important pieces of software you can have, because that's what, how you build software to begin with, cost money. It cost two, $200, dollars and, and that was in, in 1990. And uh, so the barrier of entry into software development was really high for most people. If you were a hobbyist or something, that was very difficult to do. With GCC and GNU, we're able, that barrier almost just went away, and and because of that, more people were able to, and they were building things like operating systems, and so you have operating systems like Linux and FreeBSD, all of these being able to do through these bootstrap tools, and and from there we started building platforms. Uh, we took all of the the kernel because it's not just Linux itself; it's all these user land tools. That, that all needs to work together to make something useful, to make a platform. And once you have a platform, you can start, people, you started building languages, computer languages. Uh, again, building blocks, where, where, and there's a wide set of languages, and those languages beget things like uh, application frameworks, uh, virtual, virtual uh, technology, and this wide set I was talking about, GitHub, the wide set of open source tool chains that we can all choose from uh, with a free and open license. And of course, uh, the web technology, the web servers, which really drove the early uh, open source movement uh, back in the day. And from there, now you have your, your, your sophisticated tools of communications, your web platforms, your app platforms, uh, now the cloud technology that's become so pervasive today. And of course, now we're moving on to big data and machine learning and, and so forth. So from this, you can clearly see that in, in the past 25, and you could even stretch it out to 30, uh, what an incredible amount of engineering that's done uh, in these past years. But it's not just that, right? Um, that engineering, the output of the engineering is now a foundational thing for all these other sectors. So whether if you're in education or medical or finance, all of these things are cannot be consumed. So if you're doing medical, the things like big data or machine learning, they're, they're, I mean, there's so many of these that can be applied uh, to all these other sectors uh, to be useful. And, and so, this is one of the wonderful things about watching you grow up and, and looking at, at, at how these things are put together. So to iterate that, we, we build technology for the world to use and almost at no cost because we've, we've uh, socialized that engineering, be part of it from an aspirational point of view, right? And other parts from just simply uh, uh, that they're interesting problems to solve, uh, just from a from a you know engineering thing, and 
And, and, and this sort of shows that power of distributed communities. And what a powerful concept because we're seeing that as we're going there. It's just fantastic. And, it, and we see that in technology, but we're, we can, it can also happen anywhere else, and it has happened everywhere else. That idea of openness is why we have Creative Commons as, as a good example of how something of that concept is making the world a better place because openness is now a big thing where back in the 80s we were always been talking about our you know it's our private property and we social socialize everything that sharing is is an important part of doing business and and part of human culture and we're seeing that even at companies level um in uh in uh, uh, in this open source technology space, so we built these tools for effective collaborations, and we've also at the same time building models for human collaborations that that are built, but it's going to involve right. So in, in those days, we, we've been it's been primarily uh, driven by a, a sort of unitary culture. Uh, around engineers who have been primarily white, uh, white males, but now we're we're trying to build a culture of openness. So as we open technology, we're opening ourselves as well, uh, in by allowing people of all uh, cultures and races and and whatnot to continue to evolve the human collaboration model that's around open source and free software. And, um, and the other interesting aspect is we've, we've mostly been coming up building as silo communities. So uh, like the, the Just to Use GNOME or the, the other projects, or they, they've come up mostly solidified in, in some shape or form. But now we find that we are building, we're reaching out to others that are not just uh, within our sphere of influence. Uh, we are now reaching out to not just the kernel community or some of these other communities, but maybe the Kubernetes community, some of these other. Uh, anyway, and by that, we're exposing who we are to other communities, and, and we're moving forward by interacting with each other. And it's really a passion of mine, as you can probably tell the way I'm talking, that this is and an exciting thing for me. But it, that's not the end all. I, I, you know, we, we've been talking about these collaboration models, but we, we didn't, you know, and I'm, I may have given you the impression that, you know, we're all working in isolation here and there's never been any kind of human interaction at all. And nothing can be further from the truth. We are, have in fact, um, um, we have in fact, have challenges. We do need the human touch. We do need to see each other from a human perspective, because uh, one of the things that is that we we inspire each other when we are in your presence. Because if you have an idea, you can't really uh, replace a digital world with with the, the the analog world with a digital world, because human emotions are so much easier to understand and relate to in person than through a computer screen a lot of times. And uh, and so we have conferences that's our touch points. So during during the course of the year we may see or see each other four or five times at a time to meet and talk and discuss. Uh, so that's great. But the challenge of the COVID world is such that we um, we don't have that ability now. We, we, we have to be, we do have to do social distancing. And so how, does, how do we replace those, as a, as a challenge, how do we replace those things with what we have today? You know, today we're using, uh, we're doing uh, virtual conferences like this one. Um, but if you solve this problem, it's actually a great problem to solve because as we said, people go to conferences and need to talk to them, but that's, that's only a small percentage of us who can actually afford to do that. 
a lot of us cannot afford to go to conferences or we don't have the visa or we don't have uh, the uh, the background or wealth to to go to other go to other countries or even go within a country to go and travel and be at these meetups or, or and whatnot and so um, by being able to die we're actually making our movement even more open than it is today right so the, the next challenge is, is is to build how do we build that energy to to that that is similar to how we meet so that we can keep moving forward. And I think there's some experimentation that's already started. Like next week, um, uh, we're, we're having, a, I'm attending a conference that uses Animal Crossing, which uh, I don't know if anybody knows what Animal Crossing is, but it's a, it's a game on uh, the Nintendo Switch, which is sort of a virtual reality kind of, kind of thing. And uh, uh, several people are doing keynotes on that. And, uh, and the whole thing is being streamed on Twitch. Now, nobody, this is not a new concept that there is, there was a thing out there several years ago called Second Life, where people, it, advertising moved into, <laughs> into this virtual Second Life world, which I found very, very interesting. But uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, but uh, this is this is sort of that experimentation where uh, we can uh, maybe we get into the game world and we're trying to replace that kind of uh, interaction through that, or maybe through virtual reality. But again, it's it's the same thing as I was saying. As as these communities come up, the demand for better tools and more sophistication continues to evolve, and I, I feel that we because now there's a greater need that we are going to find ways to to use all those technologies this open technology to to try to solve that problem so i'm coming to the end of my talk um i i i as i said i couldn't i didn't get into great detail over uh, a lot of how these things come up especially in its application towards other sectors like um, you know we, we talk about all these other sectors or how do you use those, the paradigm we have here and it's always about maybe a, having a meta conversation right uh, because it really comes down to that communication and trust and everything because those are all the human factors where we put on these tech communities is how do we how do we trust your code how do we trust you right you know all those things apply even in these other sectors from a matter discussion and and we have tools that kind of show what kind of what is the trust by by some methodology right so it, so maybe we're, we're not using a a uh, a code repository in finance but we, we're replacing it with something else or other systems so how do we change those systems that kind of fit more with uh the paradigms we've been seeing in, in uh, free software and open source. So anyway, uh, so I'll, I'll close with that. Uh, I just want to say my, uh, put up my contact address here uh, uh, on Twitter and you can email me. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> so, but uh, if you're, you're welcome to, to reach out to me and, and, and have a discussion, whatever, uh, so, so I want to say give a big thank you uh, for uh, hearing my talk, and I hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it. Uh, also, I want to thank the conference organizers for inviting me and, and putting all this work in in this uh, organizing this conference. So, uh, thank you very much. Cool. Well, thank you. Uh, I hear an echo. Can you turn it off? Uh, or headphones, maybe. Okay, yeah. <laughs> the mute, that'll work. You'll just work on that. Um, so how did I know you were an Animal Crossing person? <laughs> just knew it. Um, so very quickly, um, you know, just to, and not to get too much into the whole licensing thing. Um, and I think it's very inspiring actually to uh, have a free and open source software talk that's so focused on community, right? Um, and collaboration and, all those challenges that you mentioned, ending up with all these platforms and figuring out how to how to really, um, I don't know, be a glue and talk to each other, and you know, um, 
it's uh, it's pretty amazing stuff. So um, obviously we're in the middle of a crisis right now. Um, and these communities that um, were working one way, even if they were remote teams, and not, you're no stranger to remote work, none of these folks are a stranger to uh, remote work, um, they're still working differently now, right? Um, and that there's two dimensions to that that I'd, I'd like you to sort of reflect on. Um, the first one is uh, the mental sort of stress uh, angle of that. You know, this isn't a snow day or vacation or normal work, right? And um, just go into that as much detail as you feel comfortable or maybe give some stories that, that you've heard would be great. Um, and then the second dimension of that is, uh, I think the tooling is changing pretty rapidly. Um, even summits like this, right? You know, these types of platforms are more likely to be used, like Big Blue Button. Um, where do you see all that going? And do you think that's going to change the role of, um, you know, sort of organizing these communities? Okay, great, uh, great question. So, so the first one is you're right. It, we are, uh, we are under a lot of duress, uh, and it's it's definitely not a normal time. We, um, we can read the news, or you're on Twitter, or, or you're on, um, you know, for any other other kind of platform, and we absorb a lot of the stress that other people project. Right, uh, and as they're going through their 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 own sort of struggles, that weighs upon us. Um, as free and open source people, we we really do have uh, we're no different, I guess. In, in a sense. And so the way we I have seen people relieving stress is uh, they have. Um, um, one of virtual one-on-ones, they had uh, kind of hap like a happy hour or a lunch date, or you know, we, we break apart and and reach out to the people to the communities we we're close to. Uh, so, but like I'm involved in a a, uh, a kind of community manager happy hour, right? For for a lot of them, their lives were going to conferences and meeting their friends and 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 just having these things and there's something that's all ripped apart ripped away from them <laughs> and and it's left a, it left an emotional void and the, because they can't go into and have these hallway conversations they can't leverage that kind of community thing so so what i see now is a lot of ad hoc uh virtual conferences are happening the, and and the challenge here is is i never know when they happen and they, they, they happen very organically. Uh, it could just be a, a hey, a, a thing that's happening on Twitter that's happened 30 minutes before. And that's, you know, it's, a, it's basically, they call it a hallway conversation track. They're just because that's how the suddenness and immediacy of it is. So they're, 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 they're doing things like that. Um, so we're, we're finding coping mechanisms um, as best as we can. Uh, and a lot of them are more organic. I, I think a lot of it we're seeing a lot of unplanned um, talks and things just to have something that's organic and not necessarily um, uh, something big and planned. Um, so right now, like a lot of the virtual conferences are tend to be kind of planned, they tend to be kind of large, uh, like, you know, there's Red Hat Summit. So it, Initially, that's what I'm seeing in, in terms of virtual conferences. But now we're now we're seeing a little bit of, hey, let's do it through four or five, six people, or and and so it's breaking down to smaller and smaller pieces, uh, which I think is quite interesting. And uh, so that's something uh, I'm seeing. And can you repeat your second question to go through all that? Well, you, you sort of you sort of reflected on it already, so. Um, um, yeah. So I guess, so I, guess I, I, I just mute real quick. Thank you. Um, so I guess uh, I started to ask about licensing, and I, I wandered off a bit. But uh, these things obviously are are complex and do that. Um, and the thing I'm interested in from a licensing standpoint is not even so much you know which license to use, how do you foster community through it, or anything like that, but I know that the concept of open core was something that was sort of rising up 
um, this idea of uh, sort of open sourcey and not so much um, before the crisis. Uh, from my perspective, I don't see how that business model is really going to survive very well, um, the way things are moving. So if you could reflect on that, maybe your observation is different um, and, and where you think that's going. So um, open core, uh, just in the community I'm with, is, is, is not really embraced um, uh, very well. We're not really embracing that concept. Uh, and I think it, I think a lot of that is is based on it's like you don't have the right business model. Or it's like you know what this is about, and and you you built this thing. So open core uh, it doesn't resonate for a lot of us, uh, and, and and that's not just the free free software, but the overall open source uh, community as well. Uh, I don't. How they survive through this crisis, I, I I'm not sure because I don't I don't think they have quite the resiliency as a, a pure open source model is right because you're 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 restricting right it's not real open source because you're saying well this little part here is but not this part and and so um, I don't really know where where that's heading because i think we're still kind of early in this curve to, to see what's going to happen next but i would be very interested to see where this what happens to these companies and whether a pure open source model really does mitigate challenges like this as opposed to an open core model so Cool. So we've got a question from the chat here. Um, so Shri, what are your thoughts on pathways to collaborative tools to propagate and allow social action within secure communication networks? In other words, how do you pull people to safer organization as opposed to Facebook and Twitter, et cetera? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. and. Pulling people to safer organizations uh, versus uh, pri uh, privacy challenged organizations. Um, you know, a lot of this is why are people there, right? This is always the, the biggest challenge with um, uh, with organizations like uh, like Twitter, social media, like uh, Twitter and. And whatnot is is there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's an amount of people that makes it useful, right? That there's you you feel like I, I like for instance I'm on Twitter most of the time because all the politics are on Twitter, right? And the people I follow I think and so I'm kind of forced to be on this platform when I'd rather be you know <laughs> on on something else. So how how does that work and so what are the tools and platform? I, I guess is I going back to my talk is, is building this kind of sophistication. This is how do you attract people? And that means you have to find ways to attract various high level people over to other more safer social media. And um, how that happens is 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 again uh, uh, is a difficult thing. So what 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 uh, interesting part was the the L LBGT right community had successfully transferred to. Now suddenly I, I'm I'm having trouble remembering the platform, <laughs> but Mastodon, and because they didn't feel safe on Twitter, and you know ultimately a safety is 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 a, is a is a great attractor because as you said, what's safer? They are feel safe if. if Twitter is filled with right-wing white supremacists, and you can guarantee safety. Then that is one aspect that we can actually get people to move. And and they did. They moved a lot of them moved wholesale to to uh, a mask on. And so uh, I guess I guess that's one way of of what argument to be made. Uh, but if uh, how do you how do you get like your uh, uh, 
political people over. That's that's going to be an interesting question, and, and I think that really means having one-to-one -one conversation with your political people because w w the problem we have is, and I, I'll go back to the Gnome community is our community our communication channels is no longer single, right? Before, one thing I didn't note is that um, every time we, we move forward in those things, we didn't get rid of the old community uh, communication channels. So, you know, you still have IRC, you still have Mastodon, and now you're just adding. You're just, it's, it's like an XKCD comic. It just, you're just adding more. And so, so when you're asking political, they'll be like, well, they still have to be on Twitter. Now you're asking them to be on Mastodon too, and now you're managing more than one network. <laughs> so, so I think I think in the end there, there's going to have to be some kind of defining moment that causes people to to just get sick of it, right? It's just that's I think that's my uh, answer after this very long explanation. <laughs> so. Uh, but that that's I think that's probably the best I, I, I can do to answer that question. So. Sure. So um, I think uh, that moment may come sooner rather than later with the election. So <laughs> uh, I think you know that's an interesting thing about this virus, right? It exposes so many pathologies, <laughs> human pathologies because it is not a entity that can be reasoned with or bargained with or anything. It lives to spread and you must submit, uh, it, it submit to a paradigm for it to go away. And the, the people or ideologies that cannot do that are, are going to be affected uh, disproportionately. Uh, uh, from from that perspective, of course, the other people who are perspective are, are are minorities or people who are are not in the place to have good health care. Or it's the other one, I don't want to. I say that's not it, but but from just an observation point of view of how uh, people react to this, this this is something I found very very interesting. Well, on that note, um, thank you so much, Shree. Um, this has been wonderful and uh, happy to have you.